As we get started this morning, I want to address something that's been happening in our nation. It's not just this week, but the culmination from what has happened from last year all the way till now. We've had Black Lives Matter protests, we've had political unrest, and finally culminating in the attack on the Capitol this last week. What does this mean? For many of us, we may feel very anxious, fearful. We may be wondering what in the world is going on in our nation. Well, Jesus tells us, he tells us, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. He says to us in John 16, 33, in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have tribulation. But when those things happen, what you need to do is this, not concentrate on those issues, on those troubles. Because if you do, you will get sucked into them and they will bring you into a spiral of greater anxiety and fear. But he says, I've come to give you peace. Take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. So everything that the world is offering to us of more fear, more anxiety, more focus away from the Lord, Jesus says, the remedy I have for you is to know that I have overcome it all. There is an end. We know the end of the story. Jesus is victorious. We keep our eyes on him and that we can go through these difficult times together. So here's what I recommend. We take Jesus' advice, focus on him, set your eyes above on him. Begin to think on the things of this world and give them to the Lord. Set your thoughts on into heaven, what he would have for you. Think of all the things that you've thought of for 2021, your resolutions and your commitments, the new year before. It's been a staggering few days already, these 10 days into the new year. God desires for us to give it to him so that we can offer up ourselves anew and afresh. And then surround yourself with people who are also seeking the same. This is why our fellowship groups are so important as they, we're able to pray for each other, encourage each other, point ourselves to the Lord. When you find yourself being inundated with news, and perhaps more things are gonna come up in the news and the media and the world, what it has to offer, may it be a, a immediate reaction for us that we turn to the Lord. And when we do, we're gonna gain his peace. We're gonna know the confidence that he has overcome the world. Take heart, he says, I'm with you and I've overcome the world. Have a great worship today. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's wonderful to be with you again. Uh, may the grace and the peace of God be with each and every one of you this morning. Uh, as we come before the Lord, uh, it's exciting as we come into 2021, uh, but seemingly uh, nothing has changed very much. Uh, uh, I, I pray that uh, we come before the Lord in the midst of everything that is still uh, happening, the pandemic, uh, the need for healing in our nation, uh, all of these things that are surrounding us. And maybe, again, in your environments, in your homes, in your families, uh, nothing seems to have changed very much. But, brothers and sisters, every time we come before the Lord, friends, when we come before the Lord, uh, there is uh, a source of joy. There is a sheltering as we come and run to him. And so this morning, I'd like to invite all of you to please rise, to please stand. Uh, don't sit on your couches. Uh, let's come before the Lord. Let's read the word of God together. And then let's come and worship and praise him together. So if you could, uh, could you read these verses with me as we open in our time of worship today? It comes out of Psalm chapter 71, verse 1 through 3. And you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. I read that again. And you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. And your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Praise the Lord.
my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Sing that again, my hope. My hope is built. shall come with trumpet sound who oh, may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone fall and stand before the throne yes christ alone Cornerstone, weak, may strong, and the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of mountains and the seas your river runs with love for me and i will open up my heart and let the healer set me free i'm happy to be in the truth and i will daily lift my hands for i will always sing of when your love came down sing that again over the mountains and the seas your river runs with love for me and i will open up my heart and let the healer set me free i'm happy to be in the truth and i will daily lift my hands for i will always sing of when your love came down i can sing of your love Love forever. I can sing of your 
give the following time to Pastor Johnson. Good morning. As we gather here for the second Sunday in January, we're still new in this series, new in this new year. God is speaking to us and calling us to himself. We're concentrating on this theme, right? So as always, so now also, Christ will be magnified in my body from Philippians 1.20. And we're following the writings of Paul and his example as he's pleading and speaking to the Philippians. He's in jail, 61, 62 AD. We don't know if it's right uh, in the, during the house arrest or he's probably still awaiting trial. doesn't know the fate yet of what, uh, whether he's going to be released or he's going to be killed. And he's writing these four epistles to these churches, and one of them is to the Philippians. And Epaphras, one of those citizens from Philippi that has become a believer, has come and given an offering to Paul so that he can survive in prison. And he can continue his ministry, and he's ready to bring this letter back to the Philippians church to encourage them. But he becomes sick, so it's going to be delayed a little bit until he gets that letter to them. But picture this. He's speaking to them from jail, and he's speaking to them with the mind of Christ of how they can continue to go on. Remember the urgency that we spoke of last week, not being ashamed, having all courage, whether life or in death, he will magnify Christ. That comes later in this chapter, so we're leading right up to that section. The first 11 verses this week, it's entitled, Growing Together in Christ. Now, he is in jail. He needs the Philippians in terms of this partnership. And he begins to recognize, and he wants them to recognize, that they're in this together. He can't do it all, and that is, fulfill the Great Commission, and neither could they without Paul. They need each other. They need mutual encouragement, insight, and partnership. We're going to take a look more on that word later on. And it speaks to us today, doesn't it? Because in our pandemic society, we're back into shelter in place, basically, in California. We can't move around. We can't get together. We can't gather to, in worship. We're standing right here in the sanctuary. We can't do that. There will be a day we look forward to it, but we can't do that right now. And then we're confined. Just as Paul, he is in jail, and he looks forward to the day where he can come together with a Philippian church, gather around them, give them hugs, greet them in the name of the Lord. But he can't do that right now. He's confined. And so in his confinement, ministry continues. And so it is with us. In our pandemic shelter and home situation, ministry can continue. How can it? So we're going to learn from the Apostle Paul, and we're going to see what he has gone through and what he appeals to the Philippians and see how we can glean and learn from him. Number one, we saw last week that there's an urgency in Paul's voice because he didn't know how much time he had on earth. He didn't know how much time was available to him for ministry. In truth, we don't know how much time we have either. We don't know when this pandemic is going to be over. Praise God, there's a vaccine. People are getting the vaccine, and I had a friend show his card on, on social media that he got the shot. Wonderful. But we don't know when most of the people are going to get the vaccine so we can gather together again. We don't know that. So it might be quite a bit of time, and we don't need to wait. We don't need to wait for everybody to be vaccinated before ministry can continue. We need to have ministry now. God is a now God. So he's calling us to live for him today. The second thing is this, the reality of spiritual partnership in Christ. Last week we mentioned that even the Apostle Paul himself, as dynamic of a believer that he, as he was, never believed in Lone Ranger Christianity. It was about community. It was about coming together as the body of Christ. And now as one of these beloved churches, he didn't start it, but he later visited, and he's able to encourage them. He says, we can't, we got to do this together. So no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian, and he begins to make the case for them about why it's so important that need need to be in partnership together. So let's turn. As we look at this um, message today, one, we have to recognize our key theme, one of the key emphasis for this year 
is discipleship. You're going to hear about it early, later in this year. We're still talking about it now. I mean, in, in terms of uh, how we can really begin to mobilize everyone in our congregation, everyone in our church. But for now, know that almost everything we can do can be under the umbrella of discipleship, but we're going to get much more specific later in the year. If you have your outlines, follow along with us right now. Point number one is this, and that is we are in this together. And it's from the first two verses in Philippians, and it says this. It's, it's this general greeting to the church. Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says it's from Paul and Timothy. Why does he include Timothy? It's very likely that Timothy came to Christ in that area, from that ministry. Matter of fact, he was one of the people that helped found that church. So it's Paul and Timothy together, and he calls them servants. And he typically doesn't always include others, but he includes Timothy here as a fellow servant, as one that's a slave to Jesus Christ, that's in service to him, that they're full-on committed to Christ, whether life or death, and he's already proved it by his experience. And he includes Timothy in this. Grace and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, undeserved merit, favor, and the face of God shining on his people. May that be for his people there in Philippi. Favor from God and his accompanying peace. When you have the Lord, you have the favor of God. And when you have the favor of God, along comes the peace of God. And he prays that for the people in Philippi. You see, it's true, Paul could not fulfilled the whole entire Great Commission. He was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, but now he's able to train up others who are able to train up others who are able to train up others. And how do you know when he's accomplishing this, when he can see it, when they begin to pass on their faith, when they begin to pursue Christ together, when even when he's not there, they're beginning to pass on the faith to others and in generations after them. Paul is beginning to see this. And it brings so much joy and happiness to his heart. It's not a fleeting thing. His mission is being accomplished right before his eyes. Not just through his own actions. Not just through Christ, what he can do in and through Paul, but now through all of the believers. It brings him a tremendous amount of joy. It's a kingdom mindset. After all, Paul is in prison. The Philippians are relatively new believers, new church. They have uh, leaders, though, and overseers and deacons. The church is roughly around 10, 11 years old. The greetings here is to the overseers and deacons, greetings them. So you must have been, at least heard about them. They have this minor church structure already in place, people who are caring for the flock, people who are serving Christ. They already have this dynamic and this understanding that they're not just to be recipients of God's grace, but they are also to administer out of God's grace to others. This is so powerful for us because many times Western Christianity, we've been accused of just being users, essentially. We'll take all of this stuff, but we hardly give. And so Paul here is speaking in his, in his direction and his example. These are the ones that get it. They've received the grace of God, and now they've, they're pouring their lives into service, not because they have to, but because now their spiritual eyes are open. Now because they realize what's of true value. You can't help but give yourself to the things that you value most. And what they value most, they begin to live out. And it shows and demonstrates in your life. Now we can stop right here and just say there's a key lesson here. It's one thing to give a quote-unquote Sunday school answer. Yes, Jesus is the answer. And he is. It's another thing to say, I know Jesus is the answer. This is how I'm living it in my life. This is how he has demonstrated it in my life. And this is what the Philippian church is doing. They're not just giving Paul a Sunday school answer. They're beginning to show it with this, their lives. And it brings so much joy to Paul. And we hear it. This is called the epistle of joy. It's because it's not that there's no problems here in the Philippian church. Matter of fact, in chapter 4, there's, there's, there's a 
there's a disruption. There's, there's a dis disagreement that, that, that threatens to, to bring harm and bring to the congregation and unravel everything. So it's not that it's a perfect church, but they're on the right track. And because they're on the right track, doing the right things, pursuing Christ brings joy to Paul. It's exactly what he would want for himself. And he's seeing it lived out and emulated in those that have now received the gospel. Well, there's, he prays for them. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. A spiritual eyes to see that they need to be together. We are in this together. We need each other. We're better together than apart. Take the pandemic right now. It's easy for us to be apart because it's the law, essentially, or it's the instructions from those that are in government and, the, and our, our, our authorities. However, the choice of being together is still available to us. We can come together online, social media, on Zoom. We can still write each other, call each other, email, text. The choice of being apart is simple, but coming together is the choice. And we got to make that choice and say, we're better together than apart. I had conversations this last few weeks about people who are pretty comfortable with this current situation. Why? Because they're introverts. Introverts doesn't mean that they don't want to be together in worship and they don't like getting together or they don't like going to New Year's Eve parties. That's not it. It's that they, they, there's, a, there's an okayness about it. They can be in a room by themselves. They can read for five hours at a time. They're fine. But they still, at the time, need and crave human interaction. And that's what we're speaking about. So whether you're an introvert, extrovert, there's something about the body of Christ that says, you can't do this alone. You weren't made to do it alone. God put you together in community. Figure out how to come together by choice. We can't do this physically, but we can do this online. We can still connect with others. And there's many, many different ways. We're learning also that the church is not a location. You can be in various parts. As a matter of fact, one of the most striking things is, is being in these morning prayer meetings together. There are literally people from the other side of the world coming together and praying with us. And we're able to pray together. We're coming together through this technology, we're, by choice, we're coming together. The church is a spiritual entity made up of people scattered around the world. And so it's not a location. It's wonderful as, that we love to identify church with, let's say, our beautiful building. It's more than a location. It's the people, the fabric, the organism that makes up the church. And we come together out of conviction, not because it's convenient for us. We make the choice of coming together. That's why the connectedness is so, so important. And perhaps if growing relationships is one of your key 2021 commitments, this is a great week to do that. Hone in on this by calling somebody, coming together perhaps on our, our Zoom um, prayer meetings together, Tuning together with the body of Christ on Sunday morning, just as you're doing right here. These are conscious choices you're making. Not because it's convenient, but because it's a conviction that what God is calling us to do. All these other things. You can, you can send care packages. You can put an encouraging sign on your yard. You can have a virtual game night, connect with others. Uh, post good news. Um, make mass. Start a book club. There's so many things that we can still do while we're connected together, but we have to make a choice to do that. We need each other. You are, maybe God made you really strong, but you are not created to be alone. You're created to be in community. So we need each other. Make that choice this week to, if people don't reach out to you, you reach out to others. Second point that we see from the Apostle Paul is be thankful how God works in others. Now notice this. Paul can be very thankful how God works in his life, but now he's finding great joy in seeing God work through other people. Now, we have to put aside that whole 
jealousy and envy thing when we do this. There's something when we just applaud. When God works, and God works in others, we applaud that. We don't say, well, God, how come you worked over there? You didn't work here in my life. No, we applaud any time when we see the goodness of God and the righteousness of God and the kingdom of God go forward. And when others are blessed, we give thanks for God working in their lives. That's what we see here in the Apostle Paul. Look at verses 3 to 5. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. First, he was, thought, he was thankful, again, even though there was disunity amongst the two sisters in the church, threatened to bring down the peace of that congregation, they weren't a perfect church, but he was thankful for them. Why? Because they were, they were showing and demonstrating fruit in ministry. Now, they had already made a profession of faith, and that's a wonderful thing. But more than that, Paul was now beginning to see that they're living out their faith. Well, clearly already, he is a recipient of their love and generosity. They've taken an offering for him. They've heard about Paul being in prison. They've taken this offering, and now Epaphras has brought it to represent the church at Philippi, and he's offered it probably a quite a large sum of money and given it to the Apostle Paul. But it wasn't just the monetary amount that impressed Paul. It was now the working of God in their heart because he recognized for them to give as they did meant that God was working in their lives. And if God was working in their lives, that's what made him smile. That's what brought joy to the Apostle Paul. That the Spirit of God that saved them is the same Spirit of God is now that's working in them. They're growing forward. It's not just that they're content with salvation. They're pressing on for more, which is another theme here in the book of Philippians. And he was joyful. He was joyful. He was joyful because he smiled as he saw basically spiritual children. Him preaching to Epaphras. Epaphras bringing the message of Christ to entire city and now generations of believers. He could just smile. Just as a grandfather or grandmother smiles at a newborn, he smiled at the spiritual children now and their own development. Now, when you look at your own children, I know we did, when we looked at our own children grow, you didn't mind if they didn't do it perfectly, especially when they started walking. Their knees wobbled. They took one step forward. They sat down. They fell down. They wobbled some more. They wondered if they should ever walk again since they fell. They got up again, wobbled, took one step. Next time they took two steps. And all along, that entire process, it just brought delight to our heart. You didn't focus on the imperfection. We focused on the effort and the growth. That's what's important. And one day, it happened. They walked. And they still wobbled, and perhaps they fell. And then a few weeks later, they fell less until after a while, they didn't fall at all. They could actually walk across the room and run across the room. And so it is with the Apostle Paul as he saw his spiritual children grow up right before his eyes. They wobbled. They had these attempts, but now they were actually growing in Christ. Their giving, their generosity, their heart was being transformed. They were maturing in Christ, and he rejoiced. And we should, too, when we see others come alongside, begin to grow in their faith, we encourage them. Again, the focus isn't on the imperfection. The focus is on what is happening in the heart and what God is doing inside of those people. The key thought here, look at this in verse 5, is because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. What is that word partnership? Well, that word partnership is the good old Greek word koinonia. And it is general, it is more than just 
partners in, uh, on paper or a legal document type of thing. It's genuine, heartfelt, almost like a marital relationship, husband and wife type of relationship, very intimate, very close. It's not a casual relationship, but we're in this together. They're pulling in the same direction. There's a deep and abiding love for each other. There is an, a, there's a love for Paul because as they hear the stories from Epaphras and they hear about Paul's testimony, they thank God for this man. Some of them have met, them, met him, some of them have not. But there's a deep abiding love there. And Paul, he's just overwhelmed with this love for, the, for them because their success, their growth, their being used of the Lord, oh, it just reflects on his own ministry. Yes, Lord, I didn't do this uh, in vain. You've now used it to grow people. You've now used, what you've called me for has come to fruition. One of the great joys about being a preacher, a pastor, is not necessarily the giving of the message. And this is a wonderful thing, to give messages, to give Bible studies. That's not really the fullest clear joy, although it's a wonderful joy and a deep abiding thing that God is working and His Word is going forward. What really is amazing is when a person comes back after a week or two or even a few days and says, guess what, Pastor, this is what I did. This is how I put it in practice this week. I heard you say this on Sunday, and there's something about it, and the Spirit of God worked, and he, it just hit me right there in my heart, and I decided to do this. And again, just as with spiritual children, it doesn't mean it's perfect, but it's the attempt. It's what's happening in the heart. And when changes come about, I go, wow, that's awesome. Then I know that the Word of God has not only gone out, it's been caught. It's been received. And when it's received, it's put into action. And when it's put into action, it brings forth fruit. That's why the Apostle Paul, after just hearing story after story, you see, Epaphras, he didn't just bring an offering from Philippi. He bought, brought account after account after account of what was going on. He says, Paul, if you could see it now, what's going on in the church. You can't believe it, but we had to start new small groups on the side. You can't believe it, but people right now, they're getting the marketplace right here. Remember when you, were for, you wanted to do that, you were talking about the marketplace? They're, they're, they're right out there right now talking to everybody. You're talking about sharing the faith and everything? It's, it's, they're, they're doing it. They're, they're sharing. Almost every household now has heard about Christ. You can't believe it. It's spreading like wildfire throughout the city. How it just warmed his heart to hear this. And it was his intention one day to go back there and visit. But that's the kind of thing that happens. He is so thankful, and he truly uses it. And, and it's translated here not as fellowship, but with partnership, because it bring out, brings out this nuance of this word, that it's together. This is an extension of the work of God that was started with Jesus, passed on to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul passed it on to Epaphras and Timothy, and now the entire church has caught it. And they're doing it. And so they're in partnership together. This, if we can catch this, for SVCA, for our ministry in English ministry, how we, it's not just one or two people, not just small group leaders or not just myself speaking on Sunday morning or anyone else, but we're saying we've all caught it and we're bringing it back to our homes. And we're bringing it back to our social networks and where people are beginning to give calls and people are beginning to send out emails and people are beginning to tell their neighbors and people are beginning to say what is going on, not just Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they're all days of the week and this is what's happening. That's the picture we get of the early church and that's the picture Christ is calling us to. And this is that urgency that Paul is talking about. That if we're going to glorify Christ... It can't be a once-a-week thing. It's a glorification of Christ that covers every day of the week and perhaps even every hour, how we, how we live. That's the picture Christ is, is, is painting for us. That's the picture Paul is painting for us here and how he delights in the Philippian church. And it really is a great picture for us, for SVCA, as we go forward. This is a picture 
that wherever we go, we put it into practice and it catches fire. That's what God, God is calling us to. Number three, look beyond your spiritual birth to your entire spiritual life. Verses 16. There's a lot of people that their spiritual pursuit basically stopped after they somehow said yes to Jesus once. I did it. I got eternal life. I'm there. And that's it. And now it's a shame. That's never the picture in the Bible. That's not the picture that Apostle Paul paints. As a matter of fact, he encourages them to go forward even more now that they're in Christ. So let's take a look at this. Because this is so instructive to us. It may not be true of anybody else in our church, but definitely in Western Christianity, we got this thing where many people just think just because you said the prayer once or you, you, you said yes to Jesus once, it's, it's all, that's it. That's the height of the spiritual experience. And there's so much more than that. Let's take a look at this. Starting from verse 8. Let's just look at verse 8 first. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. See, what was started, the gospel coming to the city, the gospel coming to their hearing and in their heart, them capturing that and now finding Christ, that's a wonderful beginning. How they collected an offering, that was a demonstration of their maturity and of their giving and of the love of Christ. That's wonderful. And Paul just says, keep on going. Keep on going because he's going to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. When he appears, when we stand before him, at the day of judgment. So this trajectory that began with spiritual birth continues onward. It doesn't end. While we have time here on earth, it's time to grow. The Bible, or theologically, we call it sanctification, to be more sanctified, set apart, holy for the Lord. We don't get to perfection here on earth, but we grow toward it until the day of Jesus Christ, when we stand before him. And only in our glorification, when we have a new body, that we're perfect before him, that is sinless, will never become deity. But God perfects in us the image of Christ. So he, he's appealing to them. Even from prison, he, he's ministering. He's teaching. And he says, don't let up. He just doesn't say this. He doesn't go, I, I'm so thankful to hear about you guys receiving Christ. I'm so thankful that I got this generous offering. God bless you, and that's the end of it. He's saying, look, those things are wonderful, but let me tell you, there's so much more. There's so much more. Especially if you're young, you're in Titus, you're in Timothy, you might even be in Thomas Fellowship, and you're thinking, I'm still young, there's many years before me. Let me tell you, from the experience of those who have gone before, not only just myself, but others, that there's so much more in Christ. There's so much more in terms of what God wants to do in and through your life. It's not just have you come to the Lord. Yes. Now how are you living it? How is your life going to be different in 2021 than 2020? He wants to bring you deeper. He wants to bring you further. He wants to use you more if you will allow him to. And that's the thing. There is a partnership with Paul and the Philippians, but there's also a partnership with us and God. God always does his part. He invites us into his work. We have to step into that. If we don't step into that, we just simply won't grow. We won't see those amazing accounts and miraculous works and what God was going to do we have to be in partnership with God. Now, this is, again, last week we touched on it a little bit. We're not saying we do things that only God can do. We're saying that we can only be of use to the Lord when we're submitted to him and as a vessel for his use, we're open to how he uses us. 
The master, Jesus Christ, calls the shots, how he's going to use us. But we have to be open to that. If we, can, we put up our, our boundaries to the Lord and say, you can only have this much of me, Christ says, okay, I'll take every bit that you give me. But since you've confined it to that much, I can only use you that much. And what Christ is saying here, what Paul is saying is, don't limit God that way. You have to say, look, I'm fully in. So when he starts out the letter here saying, Paul and Timothy, servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's saying, look, Paul and Timothy, we're fully his slave. We're fully his servants. We're fully committed. And Philippians, you've got to be fully committed. Not everybody's fully committed. Some were just in it for the salvation part. And Paul is saying there's so much more, but in order to get more, you've got to commit more to the Lord so that he can have more permission to work in, to, in your life. If you ward off God, you push off the Lord, you're going to be limited in how he's going to use you. So what he's saying here is look beyond. He's finishing this good work. There's so much more. Don't limit yourself with just maybe taking an offering. There's so much more. He's going to use you perhaps to, to reach neighboring cities. He's going to use you to reach other, other places, relatives, communities, whole groups of people that are unreached. He might be able to use you here, here in SVCA, hearing this message right now. It might be definitely outside the walls of this church, groups that we are not connected with right now, but because you're open to being used of the Lord, he can use you to reach those people. That's how the Lord works. He hears your heart. He hears your prayers of faith. He says, I'll honor that, I'll use you. So he wanted them to go beyond. That there is a gospel component here. That as they have received the Lord, there is so much more working in and through. Do you realize that when you begin to give of your life, you grow more in Christ? If you wait to always receive, you're like the Dead Sea. All right. You want to continue to give in your, your life. That's how you grow. You won't run out. God will simply replenish you. Don't worry about it. The goal, though, is to be like Jesus, right? To the day of Jesus Christ, to be like Jesus. Verses 7 to 8, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. It's right, he says, proper for me to think this way. Why? He had them in their, his heart. This is an extension of his ministry. Now they are fellow partners, fellow heirs in Christ. It's not just he that has appointed the Gen apostle to the Gentiles, now they too can reach out to the Gentiles, being Gentile themselves. There's a deep bond, a, a love of Christ that's within them. And so he truly loved them. And so he said, in my imprisonment and in my defense and in confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers. He will be able to be under house arrest for two years, with the funds given him, he'll have resources perhaps to buy things, minister out of where, where he's going to be serving. And they're partners in that, literally. They're funding his ministry. They're spiritual supports in praying for him. And so Paul is saying, as I am here in jail in Rome, I'm praying for you as I'm giving you instruction, encouragement, and prayer that you be my hands and feet for Christ because I cannot roam the streets of Philippi. I can't do those house visitations. I can't talk to your brothers and sisters, but you can. And so they're partners together. What Paul could not do, they could do. And what they could not do in being a presence in prison and minister out of faraway Rome, Paul can do. So they're truly partners together in this, and he deeply loved them. Watch this. It's not just earthly friendship. This love is deep abiding in Christ because they're pulling in the same direction. At their core, they want to glorify Christ. 
at their core, they desire nothing more than that the word of God would get out, that it would be received by the, their loved ones, that they would hear and be convicted. And so they are. And so they're, they're so like-minded, so centered in Christ, fellow heirs. No wonder, he says, it's appropriate, it's right for me to feel this way about you. Number four. We see here in verses 9 to 11 a sorely needed end times prayer. Verses 9 to 11. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. So be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He doesn't even wait till the end of the letter. Nine verses in, he already has a prayer for them. He's thankful, he's praying, he's constantly praying for them, and now he's going to tell them what he's been praying. He says this, first, there's two parts to this prayer. First is a prayer for their growth in love, growing in love. The first part, verses 9 to, to the middle of 10, that their love may abound, that they may be able to prove, that is discern what is excellent. See, this first part of the prayer looks to the time interval between the present, where they are, and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, between now and then, you have time, you're alive here, you abound in love with all knowledge and discernment. That this love is the word agape love. It's God's unconditional love. It's going to abound in all situations, particularly when it's difficult. And he's going to call into this text again, particularly when we have the two arguing uh, sisters later on. But don't let the love of God grow cold. The love of God has called them into relationship, have forgiven their sins, built up their, their church, added to the sweetness of their fellowship. Now is not the time to grow cold. Now is the time to continue on this attitude of Christ-like love. It's the same situation that we have with the, with the Good Samaritan. The lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus responded, which of these was the neighbor? You see, the person asked the wrong question. It was, who is my neighbor? Jesus is, which one of these neighbors are you going to minister to do first? It's because of love that love demonstrates itself out by action. Again, we, are, we should be pierced in the heart in our Western societies. We think in the West, it's very Western, that if we hear a principle, we've received it, we got it. In the East, you hear something, you, you receive it, you don't have it until you put it into practice. Then you can say you really know something. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. He goes, what you have, it says, to abound means to be present in abundance. That their love was to be present in abundance among them. You can imagine writing with a heart full of love, wanting and yearning to be there, but can't. He says, please love each other deeply for me. I can't. The love of Christ needs to be there. It's going to protect you. It's going to sweeten everything. It's going to strengthen you in difficult times. Don't let that wane. This whole issue of knowing again. The word here, know, is the Greek word gnosis. It's not the Greek word oida. Oida is factual knowledge. But being Jewish, Paul knew exactly the difference. Gnosis is very different because this is experiential knowledge. When he says he knows Jesus Christ, he means I know what it means to walk with Jesus Christ and to obey him. When he says I know what it is to suffer, he doesn't say I just kind of know what it means by the description. He goes, I have suffered. I've gone through these things. When he says don't hold anything back, he knows what it means because he hasn't. And we know from the life of the Apostle Paul, he's lost much, but he's gained way more. But he can say he's sacrificed for Christ. And so that's what he's calling them to, the same experiential knowing. 
that goes way beyond the factual knowing of, that we have here in the West. And he also then wanted them to grow in the latter part, of, first part of verse 10, so that they were able to distinguish between right and wrong. Okay. Christ is coming back soon, but they needed to prove what is excellent so that they may live in such a way. Secondly, it's this prayer for their character development, complete character. Starting from the second part of verse 10, it says, And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Another phrase that just takes off in the book of Philippians, particularly in this first chapter. The second perspective takes a look back from the preparation of the church for that event. See? So, be pure and blameless. So starting from the day of Christ, from judgment, looking back now. See, the other one looked from their time to the judgment. This one looks from the judgment back to the church. The day is coming. The day of the Lord, the day of Christ, of judgment. On that day, what's going to matter? How many coins you have in your pocket? How many things and gadgets you have in your house? He says, look and think soberly about this. Especially in this early part of 2021. People are already putting goals together of what they're going to do for 2021. Some people are thinking, I'm going to make more money. I'm going to get more stuff. I'm going to make a name for myself. And on and on and on and on it goes. And Paul is saying, look, the day of Christ is around the corner. It's coming. And on that day, what's going to count? All this stuff that people are concerned about is not going to matter one bit. But what's going to matter is your character. What's going to matter is who you are in Christ. And so he says this. In your character, be accountable. In your character, grow into Christ-likeness. In your character, grow in your love. You know, Matthew 24, 12 says, Jesus describing the end time says, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Now he's speaking at that time to everybody, but particularly the, the believers are hearing this too. We're in a day and age right now when we saw 2020, at least in my years of living, one of the most divisive years that we've gone through politically, um, just in, relationally, just everywhere around us. The love of many people has disappeared. It's not just that it's ice cold, it's no longer, it's non-existent. And, and Christ is identifying a time, in the end times, which we're living right now, the love of many will grow cold. But in your character, may it be blazing hot. Grow in your love for one another. Let that be a hallmark of who you are in Christ. Don't let that go. And then he says this, you must be pure and blameless. Pure and blameless. The word pure has added two Greek words together, but what it means is when you put it up against the sun and it shines through, that it's able to be judged that there are no contaminants. It's pure. So you hold up something to that bright sun and you could see that it is pure. That's the picture. When we're held up to the Son of God one day and we're judged before Him, all our impurities will be seen for what it is and they'll fall away. And only what was done for Christ will last. Only what is, if godly character will last will go into eternity. Flesh and blood, sin and death will not go into the kingdom of God. Only that which Christ has won is building up in us will go on into eternity. So Paul Again, not being morbid last week, but he has this in mind. He doesn't know how long he's going to live. And he's encouraging the Philippians to think soberly about the short time. It doesn't matter if he's speaking to a 10-year-old because a lifetime is still short. And if that 10-year-old lives to be 120, that lifetime is still short in light of eternity. It doesn't matter if he's speaking to 50-year-olds right now and they're... And the, and, and they live to be 75. It doesn't matter because in light of eternity, time is short. 
That's what Paul wants them to see. Have a greater horizon, eternal perspective. And so on it goes. He speaks about the fruit of their life that would be pure and blameless in their actions. And it's fruit. It's a harvesting term. That the fruit, that the fruit of their lives ultimately is a fruit of righteousness. That they prove their salvation by how they live. So he says, yes, you need to provide for your family. You need to think about what's going on in life. How are you going to to simply survive. But don't worry about those things. Christ will watch over you. He will provide those things. You, though, live in light of God in Christ. Let love characterize your life. Move and see others as valuable because they are. We need each other. We need to grow together in Christ in community. So this is why Isolation, even though Paul is isolated in jail, he appeals to them to grow in love. He requires it of others because you have to love truth. You have to live by the truth. You have to come to a place when you see these deep insights of an eternal perspective that you value the family of God. Will you do that today? Value those that are around you. If you have people in your household that are not of the family of God, share Christ with them of the heart of love. Christ has already gone ahead of you with this spirit, confirming your word. Just go and speak and live a life of love amongst them. And also confirm your love to them who are believers, particularly those in the household of God, Christ calls us. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the Christian life that we do not live it alone. But God, you've given us the wonderful family of God. And even early in this year, we come together and we agree with the Apostle Paul, yes, Lord, you've called us into community. And not that we're going to glorify you individually, but you've called us to do this corporately together. How much greater joy there is, how much more wonder there is when we can encourage one another and pray for each other and see others flourish and grow and give thanks for them and pray. And so it is, as we think of those that are young, in this church, whether it's in the children's ministry, youth ministry, we value, God, the growth of those who have come to Christ, who are in Christ, and they are flourishing. And we give you thanks for them. We pray, Father, all of this, and we represent ourselves to you for your glory, that you may be magnified. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Johnson, uh, again. What a wonderful reminder that even though we are apart, we are in our own individual homes, but there's a precious moment here right now. Uh, We get to come and gather together before the Lord, to come to remember our Jesus together, uh, to come uh, once again uh, to bow in the posture of worship for the wonderful salvation, the wonderful thing that he has done for us, not just for you and for me, but for his church, for his entire church, and to recognize that we're not the only one worshiping today that the entire body of Christ is prostrating, is bowing before Jesus and worshiping him. And so, brothers and sisters, again, uh, this morning, as we come to the Lord's table, I invite you, invite you with open hearts and come and be ready to offer a sacrifice to the Lord that is worthy, is worthy of what he's done for us.
of a broken heart. Let's sing that again. I will offer up my life in spirit and truth, pouring out the oil of love as my worship to you. In surrender I must give my every part. Sacrifice of a broken heart. Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? What can be sung? Oh, my shame away. No. 
here because of the love of Christ. The love of Christ compels us not only to tell others about him, but for us to be forever thankful and grateful. It's the love of Christ that caused him in obedience to obey the Father, to come to this world, to take on human flesh, to be amongst us and then be crucified by his own creation. How great it loved that God of the universe would lay down his life for us. And so the appeal of love, the natural response to love is to love back. Our love isn't perfect, but now as the Spirit of God is in us, as we come before the table say, God, Spirit of God, work in us. Do what you can do, only you can do in us to bring about the response that we do not have in ourselves. We need your Agape love in and through us. In our flesh, we cannot please the Lord with what we have, but the Spirit of God in love can. So God, remind us again of the love of Christ, His great sacrifice that now burdens us, compels us to give thanks, to be grateful, and to live a life for you. So we do that right now. I just want to pause right now. Second Sunday of the year. It's going by so fast. But you would already begin to think about your life this week. How God is working in and through you. Think of all the blessings. Your salvation. Your family. Your job. Your work. Your home. Your clothes. Everything God provides for you, his presence, his blessing, his purpose, all of these made possible because Christ came to seek and save you. Give thanks. Pause in just a moment. Give him thanks. As you've commanded us, we break bread. We come before you fully, Lord. Hear our hearts, hear our minds. To exalt you, to worship you, to give ourselves for you afresh. Do in us only what you can do. We're not holding back, God. You held nothing back from us. May we make a full commitment to you. We don't know where this is going to lead, but that's okay because you're in charge. But when we give you permission, when we release all of these things, perhaps the things that you're thinking about, worried about, he's going to take it all. He's so good. Thank you, God, for winning it all, purchasing us us with your own body and blood. We remember your sacrifice. We take now. Thank you. We take also the cup. Sacrifice unto death. Jesus did not hold anything back. At this early part of the year, is there anything that Christ is calling you you know, to give up, to lay it down for him. It's easy to give him our problems, our troubles, and worries. But is there something that is, oh, that's so good. It, it's creeping up to that idol status. It's almost wanting to nudge Jesus out of your life. What is that? And God said, can you give me that? I need that. He gave his life. You give him these things. 
he speaks to you to give it to him. Drink, knowing that the new life is yours in Christ. Let's take it together. Thank you, Jesus, for new life. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you, God, for the new life we have in you. Release us from this place to live for you, not simply waiting for another spiritual experience next week, but God, you're with us every moment of our lives. May we exalt you in our living, always, especially now. Christ will be glorified in our body. May it be so, in Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, as we conclude this morning, uh, I pray that you had a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. I just want to remind all of us, you know, the theme for uh, our church this year is that as always, so now also, that Christ would be magnified in us. Uh, we recognize that in our world, uh, our immediate circles, uh, we need to find a way uh, to bring Jesus uh, uh, into uh, uh, the lives of those who are around us. So again, as we close this morning, uh, I'd like to invite you to stand and sing the song together. Uh, be glorified. Be glorified. 
Jesus, this is our prayer. This is our heart's desire. Lord, that really through us, every one of us this year, God, you would be glorified. You would be magnified. We give you thanks. We give you praise. God, may your peace, may your joy abide with your people in the coming week. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters and dear friends, again, uh, we love the fact that we were able to come and worship together. I pray that the peace of God, the joy of God uh, would be with each and every one of you in this coming week. Uh, just some few uh, announcements. Uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, there's a Knowing Our Church series. Uh, so if you want to get to know SVCA, if you're um, uh, joining us online or you've been at church for, for, for quite some time, and there's a series that we'd like to walk everybody through so that you would get to know our church a little better. Um, uh, go on, go to svcae.cc. Uh, you can reach out to the contact person, Pastor Johnson, and then find information on how to get into that class. And again, we invite everybody, we encourage everybody, you know, on Friday nights, join our small group fellowships. Tuesday nights, please make every effort to come and pray. Brothers and sisters, there's no time like this that we need to come together as a family to come and pray according to the heart of the Lord that he would press upon us. We obviously see everything that is transpiring around us. There's so many needs. And so we ask the Lord to please move us. And really this year, that as always, so now also, Christ be magnified in you and in me. That those words do not just become slogans, but become something that the Lord can actually accomplish in his church this year. We give the Lord thanks. Peace.